Our next presenter is Brian Ellis. Brian will give a status update on Southern Pine and Turpentine beetles. Brian is a senior forester working for the Department of Environmental Conservation Forest Health Unit. Brian received his undergraduate degree from SUNY Binghamton in 2008 and graduated from SUNY ESF in 2011 with a master's of science degree in forest resources management. Currently, Brian is the program coordinator at DEC for Southern Pine Beetle and Hemlock Woolly Adelgid statewide response. Please welcome Brian Ellis. All right. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Brian. Oh, excellent. I'm going to try to share my screen here and get my presentation going. Okay. Hopefully that's working. You guys can see my first slide here. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, as Bill mentioned, I'm going to talk today about southern pine beetle and um, briefly about turpentine beetles in New York and um, specifically in Long Island, uh, where we have most of uh, our activity with both of those pests. Um, and I'm just going to, I know southern pine beetle is probably old hat for a number of people, but I'm going to go through, you know, some of the basics on this beetle um, just so that we have a base foundation for what we're talking about today. And so the southern pine beetle is native to the southern United States and has been slowly uh, migrating north um, as, you know, attributed to climate change and warming temperatures and was recently found in Long Island uh, in 2014. The beetle itself is smaller than a grain of rice, so it's a very small beetle. And uh, it attacks our red pines or hard pine tree species. In Long Island, um, we see the majority of the damage on the pitch pine trees in the Pine Barrens area. Um, and it takes about two to six weeks to kill, kill a tree by mass attacking that tree. So it swarms the tree with um, thousands of beetles, um, overwhelming that tree's defenses, um, killing the tree and then moving on to the next tree. Um, it, it does, vector a number of pathogens, um, fungal pathogens um, that, uh, that kill the tree as well and assist in that. And uh, one of those indicators is, you know, you'll see a blue stain fungus when you cut, cut through a tree and you'll, that's uh, pretty indicative of your southern pine beetle attack. And so um, when thinking about how this beetle moves through the environment, um, it's often thought of as an advancing front and, you know, or a, a wildfire uh, per se. So, you know, on the left you here, you have your dead trees that are red or needleless, and those are your uh, formerly infested trees. Um, and in the middle of this picture here, you have yellowing crowns, and those are your, your active trees where the, the beetles are currently in, and they will likely move all the way onto the right to these uninfested trees on the right. And so it's under important to understand uh, how this this pest moves because um, you know that's how we design our control strategies when uh, trying to mitigate the damage um, and control this pest out in the environment. And so here are some examples of uh, some damage that southern pine beetle has caused. So this, the top pictures are you know from Texas where they, where SPV has been a lot lot longer and it can cause widespread mortality uh, very quickly in these areas. Um, in just a year. Um, and the bottom is something, um, some pictures a lot more uh, close to home for us uh, in Long Island. And so those are uh, your Central Pine Barrens uh, and Kennequat State, for State Park. And uh, on the picture on the left, you see, you know, some slightly infested areas. And on the right, just a, a year later, you pretty much have lost all of the pine uh, component to these forests. So without control, um, southern pine beetle can move very rapidly through an environment uh, and kill off, you know, quite a few pine trees very fast. Um, this is, you know, really a concern for places like Long Island that have uh, globally rare ecosystems of the, the pine barrens where we could, you know, very quickly lose all that 
that habitat that uh, is unique to the area. So we have at DEC and our partner has been working very hard to protect um, these critical ecosystems from southern pine beetle. And so what are we doing to, to do that protection? We, as I mentioned before, um, control is one of the main tactics that we use. And that involves aerial survey. So we fly over the island um, two to three times a year uh, to map out damaged polygons. So looking for discoloration in treetops from the air. Um, we then send out gr uh, ground truthing crews to go look and see what um, is causing that discoloration on the pine trees, um, be it southern pine beetle, turpentine beetle, or something else. And then if we find SPB in the area, we'll, we'll conduct spot suppression on that. And that involves cutting down those actively infested trees, leaving the dead trees because they're already evacuated and will have no effect on that southern pine beetle population. And then cutting down some uninfested trees that were nearby. And what this does is it breaks up the pheromone uh, components and helps disperse the southern pine beetles so that it can't move um, as rapidly and mass attack trees. And this has been shown to be a really effective means uh, for control of SPB. And we're lucky that S southern pine beetle has been in the southern United States for a long time. So it's well studied and they, you know, they really know how to manage these populations and, um, and intervene when, we need, when needed. So this is the strategy that we've been using in uh, the Pine Barrens and in Long Island since 2014. Um, in addition to that, we've been working on starting preventative thinnings, um, managing some of these forests, opening them up uh, to create a more Pine Barren-like habitat. Um, Southern Pine Beetle thrives on overstocked stands where the trees are stressed and less resilient. Um, so by thinning the forests, uh, creating wider spacing between trees, those trees have more resources, they're more resilient, and uh, more able to resist the southern pine beetle attack. So that's, you know, on the long-term solutions that we're looking at, we need more forest management on the landscape through these habitats so that the forests are more resilient um, and can handle SBB attacks much better. Um, and then we also uh, work on replanting native species. Um, our Saratoga tree nursery has um, pitch pine trees grown from seed, seed collected in Long Island. Um, and that way we can reintroduce trees uh, into these affected ecosystems down in Long Island uh, that, that are of the right genetic quality. Um, we've also been working to reintroduce fire uh, to this ecosystem. So a lot of these stands are overstocked due to the lack of uh, a fire regime uh, for the last number of years. And so that's you know, part of the, the story of Southern Pine Beetle is making sure to get those fires um, back on the landscape uh, to create those that pine barren habitat that um, is more conducive to healthy pitch pines. So um, as I said before, you know, these suppression activities have been shown to be extremely effective. And on your left here is a small infestation in purple uh, that we found in 2014 in East Quag. We were unable to get to suppression of that infestation, and it grew about 10 times that size in um, a matter of a little over a year. Um, and compare that to Henry's Hollow State Forest on the right, um, we were able to get to that suppression, and um, by cutting those trees and the infested trees, there was very little expansion uh, in the same time frame of SPB in that area. So, you know, this is kind of a side-by-side -side example of how uh, suppression uh, really works on the landscape when done correctly. And so, to get a kind of a picture of where we started from and where we're going to, uh, these are the number of trees that DEC staff has cut, or well, DEC staff and partners have cut since 2015 uh, in our suppression efforts for southern pine beetle. So overall, we've cut over 20,000 trees on Long Island um, in an effort to suppress uh, southern pine beetle, and the numbers of trees that we've had to cut has gone down each year. 
um, to a real low last year of almost 500 trees in 2019. So this is really a, a case of southern pine beetle being in smaller populations across the landscape instead of finding you know large areas that we need to cut a lot of trees to suppress. We're finding small one and two and three tree pockets of southern pine beetle, cutting those out, um, reducing that, that number of trees, and then, um, and those populations not growing. So we're not seeing the, the real large numbers that we had been seeing in the past. And so when thinking about this program moving forward, we're, we're really entering a maintenance phase of uh, southern pine beetle suppression um, where we're looking for in the landscape, really getting boots on the ground in terms of our um, survey and suppression and then removing uh, those trees when we find them instead of, you know, uh, emergency response phase where we're, you know, going after and having to prioritize our large infestations, sometimes not getting to ones that we really need to just because of the amount of southern pine beetle that's on the landscape. And so here's a map showing the uh, where our suppression sites were last year and where our survey sites were. Um, the blue uh, points on this are areas that we had identified from the air with discoloration um, and areas that we didn't find southern pine beetle when we got boots on the ground in that area. As you can see, most of uh, our efforts this year in cutting were at Sears Bellow Park and South Haven Park um, with some work at uh, Robert Cushman Murphy as well. So, um, you know, just a few areas that, that we really focused most of our work last year. And uh, the other side of the story, which I've sort of mentioned already, is that we survey southern pine beetle uh, from the air first, um, identifying discoloration in treetops, and then uh, getting our ground crews out to do it. So when thinking about um, how much damage SPB is causing on the landscape, we want to look at not just how many trees we were cutting, but you know how, what kind of um, damage that we were mapping from the air as well. And so um, in 2017, we started to classify the type of damage that we are seeing on the landscape uh, from very light to very severe. Um, and we've seen the acreage of our, uh, of our mapped damage decrease consistently from 2017 to 2019. The other trend to see here is that the type of damage that we've been uh, mapping from the air has been in 2019 was light, was majority of it was light to very light, uh, where in 2017 and 2018, uh, the majority of that damage was in the, the moderate and severe categories. And so, you know, we've really moved from these large infestations with a lot of damage to these light and very light uh, damage polygons where you really were looking at one, two, or, you know, maybe, a, or maybe five trees, a handful of trees that are showing discoloration. So it's not these large infestations that we were seeing in the past. Um, it is important to note here that um, if we do not control these small populations that, you know, those will grow into large populations very quickly. So we've, we've got the populations in the core under control. And then now we need to, to keep maintaining it and keep, um, keep after the southern pine beetle in order to keep it um, at a, a manageable level. And so here's an example of you know, how we map um, damage from southern pine beetle. So you know, we fly over the area. Um, we have tablets that we map all this damage. And then we, we go out to each of these areas to do the surveys. So this is our 2019 August flight. Um, showing where a lot of that damage was. And the next beetle that we wanted to talk about when talking about southern pine beetle is um, the turpentine beetle. And so the picture on the, the left is are a couple turpentine beetles that we pulled out of um, a tree that we peeled last year. And so we're seeing uh, both black and red turpentine beetles um, in trees in Long Island. And the picture on the right is um, 
the turpentine beetle compared to a southern pine beetle. So it's a significantly larger beetle. It's very similar, um, often is thought of a, as a lookalike. Uh, one of the main differences is that, as you'll see in this, that a lot more pitch is coming out of pitch pines attacked by turpentine beetles because of its size than, uh, the, than the southern pine beetle. The uh, pitch tubes are also uh, usually isolated to the bottom portion of the tree, where southern pine beetle you'll see all the way up into the canopy. So that's a good indication. So we haven't been surveying for turpentine beetles throughout the area as um, because they don't cause as widespread damage um, as southern pine beetles do. Uh, turpentine beetles will kill a tree, and they kill quite a few trees in Long Island each year, but they don't tend to move in waves and have the potential to remove entire forests from the landscape um, like southern pine beetle does. So when we go out and do our ground surveys, we do indicate if we found uh, turpentine beetles in the area. The black dots here all indicate that turpentine beetles were found. Um, and obviously you see most of the turpentine beetle activity in areas that we had um, a lot of southern pine beetle activity in 2019. Um, and that makes sense, not because it's showing the whole picture of where turpentine beetles are, but that's where most of our survey efforts went last year and where we were we were seeing um, turpentine beetles. We haven't actually gone out to look just for turpentine beetles, um, but we see it pretty widespread throughout the core. So it's something that we're definitely keeping our eye on. Um, if the damage from these beetles you know, becomes too great, there is action that we could take similar to Southern pine beetle to try to suppress some of that activity. Um, but right now, you know, we're not seeing that widespread mortality from uh, turpentine beetles. It's been on the landscape here for a long time. And so it's something we monitor and watch, um, but not something that uh, as of right now, we're overly concerned about. Um, and then thinking about Southern pine beetle in New York, um, obviously New Long Island was the advanced and is the advancing front of Southern pine beetle. But at, as a statewide program, you know, we're remaining vigilant north of Long Island, um, and we have set early detection traps up north of Long Island and pitch pine and hard pine communities to uh, monitor and see, you know, when we get, if we get southern pine beetle in these traps. So um, we did last year catch a number of SPV north of Long Island in the lower Hudson Valley and Bear Mountain State Park um, and a few other locations. Uh, because of the current situation in New York State, we have not been able to get out and survey those areas on the ground as much as we would like. Um, that is something that we will be doing in the future um, when uh, travel restrictions and things are listed more. So um, it's something, but to date, we have not found any large population or any infestations at all north of Long Island. We have just found uh, trap catches in traps. So we've seen the beetle, they've gotten there. I think a lot of people believe that, you know, wind driven dispersion and that we haven't seen any infestations north of Long Island yet. But we're hoping that by using this trap catch method that we will find those populations early and uh, have easier suppression efforts. So as I mentioned a couple times in this, the, this is an emerging issue in New York. It's at the northern end of the SPV range. They colonize areas that are overstocked, often that are affected by invasive plants and stressed trees. So that's typically how they're moving. And ecosystem fragmentation and parcelization are also a big issue in this, especially when it comes to suppression. That's uh, one of the reasons we focused really in Long Island on that core area, because that's the most intact uh, pine barren ecosystem that we have in on the island. And we really know how we're gonna, we manage it. Um, we want to increase the forest health and resilience of those forests so that they are more um, resistant to southern pine beetle activities. And we want to 
restore those impacted areas. So, you know, the real key here is that we really need forest management on the landscape to help prevent the spread of SPB or else uh, southern pine beetle is going to be a continued threat to the forests in Long Island um, and will be going through waves of um, population booms and population busts and it will be a continued um, expense to try to manage that. Um, so here's an example of some of the thinning activities that we conducted um, in 2019, 2020. They were focused in Sarnoff State Forest and we prioritized some stands. Um, we used in-house crews using hand saws as well as a, a forestry mulcher to, to conduct those thinnings. And here are some examples of the work that was done. So the picture on the left here is um, the same forest on the right. It's just covered in um, scrub oak and a much denser uh, pine forest overstory. So we thinned those trees out, mowed down the scrub oak, and you have a, a much more um, pine barren eco ecosystem here on the, on the right. So this is really what we are, we're looking for, um, where the pheromones would disperse through this area easily. Uh, wind gets into the understory well, um, and these trees are going to be much more resilient to southern pine beetle attacks in the future. So we're working on looking at creating these uh, resistant complexes um, in a lot of these forests to help uh, resist southern pine beetle in the future. So looking forward to 2020, we had a really light winter this year, and we already have reports of emergence of southern pine beetle in Long Island. Um, so I would think that this is a potential year for a rebound of SPB on the area. Um, we, we haven't seen increased activity yet in terms of uh, larger populations, but it is something to be vigilant about this year. The other concern this year is that we have limited SPB staff compared to previous years um, due to uh, the, the COVID-19 situation in Long Island. We've you know, we have less cruise uh, members than we have had in previous years, which is gonna limit our ability to get out on the ground and do all the on the ground surveys that we had in the past. So, you know, one thing that we've really been batting around in the last uh, few days even is just the need for citizen scientists to get out there, use IMAP invasives and report SPB where you see it on the landscape. A lot more people are out, um, or out hiking and if you know we get more reports i get those all new spb reports that are unconfirmed um alerts to me each day so i'm able to look at those um, map them and that would help us prioritize our, our work i think we have um one fifth of our usual staff on long island this year so it's you know we're really limited and we're going to have to use more partners and um and citizens um out there to really get the boots on the ground that we need to be able to, to figure out where SPB is and prioritize our efforts this upcoming year. And uh, that's all I got. If anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Ryan, the turpentine beetles, are they native to the Northeast? My understanding is the black turpentine beetles are, but the red ones are not. But I, you know, I'm not an expert in turpentine beetles, actually. I would probably have to ask our entomologists um, to, you know, they might know more. Okay. What are the ramifications of cutting the scrub oak, Brian? So, um, Cutting the scrub oak, as I, I mentioned before, um, fire ecosystem is really important to you know these open savannas, savanna areas. So cutting the scrub oak um, makes the area uh, more conducive to prescribed burns. It also uh, opens up the forest a little bit, creates more airflow in the understory, um, which helps uh, break up that pheromone. Uh, attack that southern pine beetle thrives on. Um, so, you know, it's a, a step in us restoring the ecosystems that are 
uh, kind of absent right now, the fire ecosystem. Um, and it also, you know, helps break up those, those pheromones. So kind of two purposes. Okay. It does grow back quickly though. So that is the one thing it does grow back. So a lot of these, you know, by mowing it down, there are still deep roots in the ground and oaks typically have that. So, you know, it's a, a continued problem in a lot of these areas. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Brian. All right. Our next speaker is Dan Gilrain, who will be presenting on winter moth and emerald ash borer on Long Island. Dan hey, is great. extension. Ahead, yeah. oh, we have your bio, Dan. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Dan is an extension entomologist and Associate Agriculture Program Director for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Dan holds a bachelor's in forest biology from SUNY ESF and a master's degree from Cornell University in pest management. Dan has been with Cornell since 1987. All right, Dan, it's all yours. Very good, Bill. And uh, I think everybody can hear me okay. If not, let me know by the chat. Um, but uh, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, emerald ash borer and winter moth that uh, we're seeing on Long Island, give you a little bit of background and what a uh, little update on what I'm, I'm encountering. So uh, uh, about a year ago in January, I got a call from an arborist uh, about a problem that was reported to him by a homeowner. And you can see pictures of what I saw there. So I went out uh, the next day, which was the day after New Year's Day, and um, saw this blonding going on and all these little bark chips on the ground, uh, which are symptoms of uh, woodpecker activity. And they're, of course, doing that because they're interested in something underneath the bark, as you've heard in other presenters today talk about. So this is referred to as blonding. And the homeowner wasn't aware of what was going on or what was the problem, but just saw the damage occurring to these ash trees. These are martial ash. Uh, that were he that had planted when he had the when he uh, bought the property. Um, so I looked more closely, and with the arborist who who knew of course what was going on also, uh, and we saw these D-shaped exit holes uh, in the bark uh, as well. Uh, looking further, excuse uh, me, the Dan? trees. Excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah. Excuse me, Dan. Can you hit the presentation view? Oh, so sorry. Yeah, that's, that's good okay. idea. It'll be yes. bigger. Good idea. Yes. <laughs> Thank um, you. So. All right, let me just see if I try this way here. How's that? There you go. That's Thank better. You. Okay, good. So things will be a little clearer there. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that. All right, so uh, we looked a little closer. These trees were pretty heavily damaged and there was some dieback um, already and uh, a lot of attacks by woodpeckers. So we peeled back some of the bark and we could see the characteristic um, uh, gallery that's forming under the bark here and we found some larvae, one of which is extracted, and you can see on the left, there's two little sharp spines at the end on the right side of that larval you'll see there. That's pretty typical for these flat-headed boar larvae that you'll find in bark, and there's nothing else that uh, it could have been besides emerald ash borers. So this was the first case that I actually confirmed with specimens. We had had an earlier case the uh, previous April that I wasn't able to check out from East Hampton area. So this was in Southold, uh, and since then we've had other cases I'll mention in a moment here. So this is all emerald ash borer. You're familiar with that, I'm sure many of you. This is what the adult looks like and the typical D-shaped emergence hole that that adult came from. Uh, came to this country uh, in 2002, at least that's when it was first detected, and it was also in uh, southern Ontario. These adults will be emerging in another couple of weeks around late May, early June or so, about the time that black locust blooms, and the peak emergence will be a couple of weeks after that, and there'll be some adults emerging uh, into the summer. Uh, uh, they live about three weeks, lay about 60 to 100 eggs, maybe even more in some cases. And there's just one generation a year. Fortunately, sometimes it may take them a second year to complete that generation, but most will emerge after one generation. And these females are capable of flying uh, up to around three miles as far as known, so they can spread pretty quickly. Um, um, but they prefer to attack trees that are uh, closer to them, but they will move if necessary. So this is the scene that's being played out uh, time and again uh, across the country, uh, at least uh, from the Midwest out to the East here, as, you'll, as you can see here, this is a picture taken in Connecticut uh, 
from uh, Connecticut Department of Agriculture staff. These are some green ash trees that are dying. They're heavily attacked. And you can see the epicormic branching um, as a result of those attacks. So these uh, trees also, when they die, they don't die very gracefully. They tend to fall apart pretty, pretty readily too. So this is a scene that we've seen um, uh, here on Long Island. Uh, here's uh, one that's in process. This is actually in East Marion, a site that I saw last year. I haven't been back yet this year, but um, these trees are all very, very heavily attacked. There's a lot of blonding, about 55 trees in this property, about a foot and a half all in diameter. So there'll be some pretty serious losses. And the impacts to the homeowners, are, of course, are significant. Uh, the concerns to the town are also great, um, or the uh, highway department, if they may have responsibility for taking care of these and taking them down and, and uh, removing them. So um, there can be a significant cost, as many of you know, involved in that. And as I say, these trees don't die very gracefully. They tend to split apart, sometimes rather uh, catastrophically or suddenly uh, when any stress is put on or even, even not. Um, so a lot of arborists won't work on them when they're uh, being heavily attacked like that. Uh, Brian Skinner has a really great video is posted. Uh, you can find it on the internet. I can lead you to that if you need to convince anybody that these trees become hazardous quickly and uh, there should be a response uh, soon after you're seeing trees that are, that, are, that are in poor condition. So if you need any help with that, get in touch with us and we can post uh, some information on the LISMA website for anybody that, that would like that as well. So as far as I know, at this point, uh, these are the areas on Long Island that I know that have confirmed uh, sightings or infestations we've seen. I just heard of one about an hour ago, an email that may be uh, in Middle Island. So that might be added to the list once we get to verify that. So um, we have not done any surveys, so I can't tell you all the blank areas in between on, on Suffolk County um, that whether they do or don't have Emerald Ash Borer, I suspect that it's much more widespread than we really know. Uh, these are the ones that have just come to my attention. Of course, across the state, uh, Emerald Ash Borer is pretty well established. This was the last update that I've seen as of early December. Uh, you'll know, at least on Long Island, Nassau County isn't colored in but I have had a convincing report from Nassau, so I would have colored that one in if I had the choice, um, but I haven't actually seen any, any samples or specimens. That was a report from an arborist who certainly knows what he's looking at, but there's uh, quite a few, and, and the, this is just the best guess at the range right now. There's some of those counties that may, may actually be infested. You may have seen some of these traps that were put up to detect emerald ash borers. I'm, uh, as I mentioned, they come out around the time black locust begins to bloom, which will be happening in a couple of weeks. Um, the purple color is, for some reason, pretty attractive to a lot of these metallic wood borers. Um, and there's also a, 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 a bait that was added to this. They're not, I would say, extremely effective traps, but they're better than nothing. That's one way to detect them in an area, and we don't have a lot of other great methods. But nature has provided one that does work really well. Um, it's just a little more work to try to track these. But in Connecticut, this native wasp, which uh, uses these metallic wood borers as its prey to feed young, um, was very effective in detecting emerald ash borer in a number of counties around the state of Connecticut. Uh, and these are common uh, native ones. You'll see them in areas with thin grass uh, where the soil is kind of sandy or a little bit bare, um, say in sand between pavers and, uh, and, and pathways and so forth. Um, there are other things that look like emerald ash borer that you'll probably see or hear about. Um, one of the common ones that we get reports about is the six-spotted tiger beetle. They're very active, especially early in the year, uh, very visible, very bright, so people often see them. Uh, but they'll be often hunting on the ground, not uh, up in the trees, um, and they'll be out much earlier than emerald ash borer would be normally. We've run across these bark gnawing beetles. These are often under bark when we've been looking for southern pine beetle. Uh, they're predators. And on the left is two-line chestnut borer that you saw a picture of an earlier infestation. That's a relative of similar size and shape. Um, but the appearance, the colors are obviously different there, but there's several other lookalikes. Uh, also, if you're looking at ash trees, you'll often see many that have holes like this. These are round holes that are, uh, these are almost certainly created by redheaded ash borer, a very common longhorn beetle pest of ash. Uh, but lilac ash borer and banded ash clearwing can also cause uh, roundish holes in ash trees. So if you're seeing those, don't be alarmed. It's almost certainly from something else besides emerald ash borer, and these are very common. If you're not sure how to identify ash, um, there's not a lot of things that look like it. There's a few, um, but you'll notice these compound leaves that are opposite. They're not alternate. They're oppositely arranged on the tree. 
uh, and not very many trees have that kind of opposite leaf or twig arrangement. And they're compound as well, of course. Uh, this is what the bark looks like. Of course, identifying ash from the bark is much more difficult, but after a while, you can kind of get a feel from, uh, for it. When you really start looking at the trees, you can see these differences and pick up on them uh, fairly readily. I uh, just want to mention that fringe tree is a host for emerald ash borer, so that can be infested as well. Uh, but it's not a preferred host, and we're talking about uh, Chinanthus virginicus, not retusus, as far as I know. There are some really helpful online guides. Here are a couple. Here's one that I show. This is from Michigan. There's a link to this on the New York DEC website that can help you in identifying and recognizing emerald ash borer. Um, if you are dealing with it or will be dealing with it, this guide that's shown in the upper left, Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees, is really valuable. It's the third edition, excellent, uh, answers a lot, a lot of questions you may have on control options and timing uh, issues with pesticides and management and so forth. So um, this would be really helpful to you if you're going to be treating for, you just want to know more about how to manage it. And there's a couple of others that I show here as well. Uh, that guide in the upper left is available from elmo-bore.info. It's uh, right online on that on the front page of that. In that guide, you'll see different uh, schedules for treatments depending on the choice of material uh, and also when you encounter the problem. And this is just to summarize from that list there. So this is all in that guide, but it's uh, summarized and distilled down to the basic minimum to give you an idea of what kind of timings there are for the different materials and different options that are available to you. Trunk injection is probably the treatment that most people will opt for, but it's not the only one. There's soil injection, not, not on Long Island, but elsewhere. Uh, soil drenching is allowed here as well as elsewhere, with different materials. Um, but there's a material that is only used by trunk injection called emamectin benzoate, and there's a number of brand names for it that I have listed there. This provides the longest residual control of any option. Uh, other ones will provide one year or possibly two, depending on the material you use and the timing and the rate that's, uh, that's applied. Um, a lot of this is covered in that guide. And the recommendations are to treat if you have emerald ash borer within about 30 miles uh, um, from, uh, uh, from, the, from um, where you're trying to protect the trees. If you are working with towns or communities or tree committees or others that are very concerned about trees, there is this community preparedness plan. And if you have not had emerald ash borer in the area, this would be a good idea. Maybe look this over to try to help in planning. There will be a budget hit for somebody who has to take care of either the, either the ash trees uh, when they die or to protect them so they don't die. So it will be good to try to plan that in advance to determine maybe which trees to save, which, which not to save. Um, as funds are available for removals, which ones to prioritize for that, and to be watchful for trees as they begin to show signs of infestation or attack. So that can be helpful. That's online at a couple of different locations. Um, there will be problems with ash wood and what to do with that. Uh, this was one site in Southall. The homeowner had removed the ash tree not knowing what was going on, but uh, this was killed by, this was being killed by emerald ash borer. It looked pretty bad, so they just cut it down, and this was heading for the local landfill. Uh, um, and it's not very far away, which is a good thing, but it's still not the right, the best way of dealing with this kind of debris. There are some guidelines that DEC provides on dealing with uh, ash from infested ash trees, and this is online at the New York DEC website that's indicated on the lower right in that photo. So um, during the period when emerald ash borer adults are active, which will be happening soon up, in, up until the end of August, it's best to leave any ash wood or firewood or logs that have infestation, leave them on site. Uh, or to chip it to about one, one inch in diameter and two or three dimensions. Um, there are other options that are listed there too. Those are somewhat more difficult, but um, those are the things that are, that are being recommended. Um, during the period when the delts are not active, uh, September through third, uh, April 30th, um, you can transport ash trees um, after September for processing, uh, as long as that's done before the 1st of May. And there's other options you can list there. I would suggest you contact DEC's forester in your area if you have ash trees on your woodlot and you're thinking of removing them. Uh, they are certainly encouraging people to do that if that's their plan um, and to work with them on the best timing and best ways so that um, trees that may be infested don't have beetles emerging on, on route to the sawmill or wherever the logs are being stored, say for uh, lumber or for um, firewood later on. Um, and just to let you know that some emerald ash borer 
can emerge from logs that are cut in the second year after cutting. Not very many will emerge, but it's been found that some can emerge. So uh, it may take a, even into a third year to be completely free of, of risk from that. Um, just to mention that earlier. Um, so I want to talk a little about winter moth in Massachusetts. Um, and here, of course, uh, we've been seeing a little bit on Long Island as well. Um, winter moth was first found and imported from Europe in Nova Scotia in the 1930s. In the late 1990s in Massachusetts, they started to see some pretty heavy defoliation and the cause was finally identified in 2003 as winter moth, um, Operoptera brumata is the uh, Latin name for that. Um, one of the problems they were seeing is that they're getting heavily defoli heavily defoli heavy defoliation in orchards, uh, apple orchards in particular, and also in blueberry plantings. Um, and part of the problem is that's out very early and it will feed on flower buds, not just foliage. So you don't just uh, get the foliation, but you lose all the future crop when that happens. There are some favored trees. I listed some there, uh, but they have a very, it has a very wide host range, will attack most deciduous trees that I'm aware of, um, have heard about anyway, and um, even occasionally some conifers, but those are not preferred. Uh, Sitka spruce, I understand, has been attacked in at least one case. And there'll be some herbaceous host that can be attacked when the larvae drop down from trees that are uh, above, as we've seen also with a uh, very similar um, fall canker worm. Uh, landscape trees, of course, are a major concern on Long Island where you'll get heavily defoliation like this and in eastern Massachusetts where winter moth has been established and major problem. This is the bulk of the problem they've seen, of course, are where they're reacting in the Boston area and so forth. They've had heavy defoliation year after year and some trees have died as a consequence of that uh, success of those successive years of defoliation like this. So this is the levels of defoliation. This is in hectares, uh, which uh, hectare is 2.2 acres. So if you multiply those figures by 2.2, you get the acreage uh, uh, um, numbers on the left side of that. And you can see that the defoliation has fluctuated, but often been quite high in many years um, until very recently. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is what we really hope does not happen in New York and, um, and we're, what we're watching out in case it does. Um, so after hearing about the situation in Massachusetts, I was approached by Joe Elkinton at UMass, who was leading some of the um, management and response efforts there um, to do some monitoring on Long Island and see if we might have winter moth already established here. So we had set up some pheromone traps and winter moth is named because the moths will fly in winter. More often in late fall is when you'll see them active, but um, it's one of the few species that will do that. Uh, canker worm, fall canker worm is another one we will see the moths that are active during this late fall, early winter period, and even during milder days in winter time as well, such as we've had. So we set up the pheromone trap and we indeed did cap capture uh, winter moth. Um, I put a little note there saying that it's similar to spruce, spruce spanworm. These are very closely related species and they're identical in appearance. You can only distinguish the two when you do some dissections in the lab and take some measurements. Um, so there was some follow-up surveys done in 2019 and 10 in Staten Island, Smithtown, Oyster Bay, Bay. There were some winter moths that were found including hybrids in Oyster Bay. These are probably hybridizing with the um, Bruce Spanworm that I mentioned earlier. And then I got reports of specimens uh, from uh, Mattituck and I have seen them again in Acrobog in 2017 and 2018. So far, I've just seen small numbers of moths that are confirmed winter moth, but I have not found areas with defoliation and I've not yet found larvae. It's easily confused with um, uh, fall canker worm, which we do have outbreaks of here periodically, and that is native. Um, and I'm just showing you pictures of the two so you can kind of see the differences among them. Uh, fall canker worm males, uh, and the males are the only winged forms of these moths. The females in both cases do not have functional wings. Uh, so the fall canker worm male you'll see has a little more pointed tips on its wings, and then there's a little white spot near the tip of that wing that you can kind of see on the edge there. Uh, whereas that's totally lacking in the winter moth male and the edges are a little more rounded. Uh, so that's, uh, and they also tend to sit a little bit differently as well. You probably won't see the females. They're very hard to find. They'll be crawling up on the bark um, and hard to uh, detect against the background as you'll see there. 
Um, so that'll give you some idea of how they compare there. The damage looks quite similar though. Um, perhaps the main difference is that fall canker worm damage will extend a little further into spring than winter moth, which is usually done by the middle to the end of May or so. And this is a typical injury that both of them would cause. But this, in this case, this is fall canker worm. Both of them would be thought of as inchworms. They have this looping kind of habit that um, they both uh, from the uh, leg arrangements here. So here's uh, a sample of winter moths. These were sent to me by Joe Elkinton, the typical very, very high numbers that they've been seeing in the UMass. And there's some damage there of, on a maple and the defoliation on a tree that is pretty typical from heavy winter moth infestations. And large numbers, as you see on the picture on the right, are not, were not unusual in Eastern Mass when they were having these periods of very, very heavy defoliation. And this is a photo, these are actually taken in Europe, but they're very typical of what they were seeing also in Eastern Massachusetts. And I was seeing pictures of these from that area and that was uh, causing me uh, some, some, no little concern, um, thinking that we didn't really want to see that here on Long Island as well. Uh, one of the reasons that winter moth can be so bad is that the caterpillars will hatch very, very early in the spring as the buds are just beginning to open. And so they'll start feeding on these barely even growing uh, tips or buds. And so in that case, the damage can be extraordinary, much higher, much more severe than you may see with something like fall canker, which comes on a little bit later. And so you can see them as they're feeding here quite early in the spring. And here's a photo from Tony Simisky just showing a close-up of what one, one of the caterpillars looks like. Um, so when you're trying to compare them, because they will often be out at the same time, um, fall canker worm and winter moth caterpillars look, look very similar. But on the right, you'll see that blue arrow is pointing to uh, a third set of prolegs that are very, very small uh, in front of the other two at the back end of that caterpillar. Uh, this is fall canker worm. You will not see these on winter moth. So if you're seeing uh, these greenish inchworms um, and um, you see this false proleg is on the right, then it could could easily be a fall canker worm. If you're not seeing it, it could be something else. And there's other caterpillars that may be, that may be as well, but um, this is one way you can at least tell the two apart if, if uh, you, you're wondering about both. A little bit on the life cycle of winter moth. The eggs are laid on bark and they're this kind of an orange color, eventually turning a bluish black as they approach hatching. There'll be about 150 to 300 eggs laid per female. They'll hatch about the time that temperatures reach around 55 degrees in the spring or a little bit warmer, and they'll larvae will begin to feed as soon as they can as the buds begin to open. Um, they will uh, feed through May and around late May begin to pupate in the soil and uh, later on emerge in the fall around uh, October, November, December or so, and uh, You'll see the males on the left and the female is on the right there. Uh, they'll mate and they'll lay eggs on the bark and they'll, they'll die. There's just one generation a year. One of the good bits of news and all of this bad news that we're hearing about today is that uh, the defoliation problem seems to have abated considerably in Massachusetts. So the last three years they've had very, very low amounts of defoliation from winter moth. And uh, the explanation for this I think is uh, this creature, this is a fly, it's a parasitoid of winter moth called Cyzenus albicans, and this was uh, released in several areas over a number of years uh, by Dr. Joe Elkinton and his staff at UMass, and UMass has a long history of uh, biological control work, and he's continued that, and there's been a very successful establishment of this fly parasitoid that seems to be bringing winter moth under control. It's not had its other natural enemies along with it, so this was introduced to try to counter that. And so the good news is that it seems to be, uh, uh, well, it has gained a foothold and has been, been, been recovered, so they're confirmed that its presence is there. And uh, so if we do run into a winter moth problem here, that perhaps can be replicated uh, on Long Island or elsewhere if it should it spread further west. So, and with that, I think I will end and see if anybody has any questions or comments. I have a couple of questions, Dan. Yeah. The first one, is for the emerald ash borer. How do researchers and managers figure out whether the wasps are finding EAB? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I'd like to ask them that too. Um, one, one way I think they do is they can send, set out sentinel eggs 
uh, on the trees and then then they know where the eggs are and then try to recover them and see if the egg parasitoids have indeed parasitized those eggs. So that would be one method that could be used. Okay, another question. Why is there so much fluctuation in winter moth population size from year to year, excluding mm. the decline in 2017? Yeah, I don't know. That would be a good question for Joe Elkinton. I mean, there's um, one thing I've heard is that uh, since the winter moth uh, levels have high, the songbirds have done extremely well with nesting, uh, more eggs, and uh, um, because you're providing a really good food source for them. Um, it could have as much to do with the predators uh, that are in the area or weather conditions uh, certainly can play a role. If you have pretty harsh weather conditions when the moths are flying in the fall, and this is true also for fall canker worm, uh, that can disrupt uh, the mating and affect uh, their survival considerably. If you get a ice storm or a severe drop in cold, that can kill off a lot of the moths if, if they emerge at the wrong time for that in the, in the fall. So that could be one possible explanation as well as possibly fluctuations in the predators as well. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Our next speaker is Jerry Carlson, who is back for a second time today. Jerry will present on emerging pests and diseases of beech trees. And as we said earlier, Jerry is Chief of the Forest Health and Protection Section in the Bureau of Ecosystem Health and Invasive Species within the Division of Land, the DEC Division of Lands and Forests. Jerry acts as DEC's chief expert on forest protection relative to biological diversity and ecosystem sustainability. Welcome back, Jerry. Oh, I'm not muted. Yeah, we can hear you, Jerry, and we can see your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to uh, see whether that's working or not. Uh, working great. <laughs> Thank you to everyone. That was an excellent presentation, Dan. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from that. Um, okay, so beech leaf uh, disease and phytophthora canker and a mining weevil and a new borer threat, uh, all risks for beech as a sustained member of our forest, which most of the people in a non-timber profession would consider to be at the top, if not the top ecosystem contributor to our forests here in New York. So we're pretty worried about what goes on with the beach. We've had, as some of you probably know, beach leaf disease for a long, long time. But there's a lot of resistance in our native stands of beach to the leaf disease or to the um, beach bark disease, sorry. And uh, we see a lot of beech trees sustaining their um, canopy positions even while they're infested with the beech bark disease, which is another complex, and I won't talk about that because it's complicated, but um, this new disease, beech leaf disease, is something that was originally seen by John Pogoshnik there in the far right at the um, Cleveland Parks right on the shores of Lake Erie. And uh, he noticed that weird striping in the beech leaves that you see in the center picture. And he mentioned it to uh, his supervisor, Connie Hausman, uh, who's also pictured there. And uh, recently, more of the pathologists in the area have picked up the decline of beech and these peculiar symptoms, notably US Forest Service pathologists Jen Cook and Danny Martin, and um, <coughs> excuse me, and of course the Ohio Forest Health Program Manager Tom Macy, and Ohio State University research pathologist uh, Enrico Bonello. So there's lots of people working on it because we saw that the trees were in decline and that they were eventually dying in large numbers but there was no apparent reason why other than this banding on the leaves. So it took quite a while to have a look at that leaf banding and um, the 
while that was going on, we were going out in New York and Pennsylvania and other parts of Ohio to try to see whether or not we could find those symptoms and look at what some of the stand level impacts would be. Well, we noticed right away in far western New York and certainly in Ohio and parts of Pennsylvania that the understory was not supported. The beach understory was no longer being supported. In fact, almost all of it was killed. Again, all of those trees that we found the leaves on, they had those striped uh, symptoms and it seemed like that was associated with what was killing them. So we also noticed that there was progressive mortality moving up the canopy to the co-dominant dominance in the stand. So what was going on here? We were worried that the, uh, humans were dispersing it somehow or mammals or birds or insects. And at about that moment when we were trying to figure out what the potential disturbance agents or the movements and dispersal were, we got a publication from the pathologist that showed that there was clearly an exotic introduced nematode, tiny microscopic worm, in the leaf that had only been previously identified in Japan and that was therefore identified as being resident in the beech leaves that had these striped symptoms. So now we call that a leaf gall nematode and that galling or striping that occurs in the beech leaves is a result of the feeding of the nematode. But still we don't know whether there is a direct causal factor from the beech leaf nematode feeding on the leaves that leads to the decline in mortality or whether or not they vector another virus or a disease or some other causal agent. We've been trying to isolate the nematodes from other parts of the tree and so far have not been successful. Um, we've done a whole year of sampling, sending them to the plant disease diagnostic lab, Sandra Jensen and Karen Snowvercliff at Cornell, and they've been rigorously dissecting these things. And we definitely found overwintering nematodes in the buds, uh, in the live buds, but we've never found them really anywhere else. So um, it's still a bit of a mystery how this whole thing progresses. Um, this is the leaf gall nematode. It's Lydilenchus crenati. Uh, as I mentioned, first in Japan and then Ohio, and it causes that banding. The, um, it's in the buds and in the leaves, but we don't know whether it's in the buds and in the leaves all year round yet, although it seems like it probably is. The striping that you see on those leaves on the right also is retained after the leaf fall in the winter, and of course the leaf turns brown, but you can still see that striping and we've sent some of those leaves to the disease uh, lab and they have not been able to isolate nematodes from that. So after the leaf hits the ground, the uh, nematodes seem to no longer be able to survive or they leave it and uh, we don't know where they go or where they're, they're uh, elsewhere in the tree. We know that they're in the buds and that they're in the expanding leaves the following spring but um, that's about where we're at with it right now. And we still, as I mentioned, don't really know why it's killing the trees. So um, in terms of uh, other nematode, similar nematode action, these kinds of leaf gall nematodes are known in other um, systems and they don't generally lead to mortality of the host. Uh, in those circumstances where nematodes are implicated in the mortality of the host, they do vector another agent like a virus and or a bacteria or some other um, uh, microorganism. So we're still unknown for that. Um, one of the things that seems to be associated is uh, a chlorophyll increase in ammonia fertilization. Uh, we don't know whether or not um, that's uh, associated with the banding and then maybe some of those compounds, metabolic compounds that are created could lead to the decline. As I mentioned before, the decline doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes uh, anywhere from three to more years. Uh, I think 
John told me last fall, John Pogashnik of uh, Cleveland Parks told me last fall that he actually has some of his original mature trees that were symptomatic still alive. So that's six years ago now. Uh, so there must be something going on either with the genetic or inherent site resistance of those trees or with the nematodes or we're missing something else completely. So hosts, uh, so far it seems like all Fagus or all beach are at risk for at least uh, harboring the nematode. Whether or not they all will die from the presence of the nematode is another thing we are uncertain of. So that would lead us to suspect that perhaps all oaks are at risk since they're in the same family. Um, we don't know whether right now while we're looking for the nematode only, uh, that's the symptom that's most easily detected and that's how we're surveying for it. And as I mentioned before, there could be bacteria or a virus or some toxin. Uh, some of the similarities that we have here in New York, maybe some of you might remember the pinewood nematode on the, um, on the black pines on Long Island, where we had this nematode come in and vectored by cerambicid beetles that killed the trees. And that has since moved to Europe and they've had some problems with the primewood nematode leading directly to um, mortality in the pine trees there. Again, it seems like the pinewood nematode is, uh, is vectoring a bacteria. So in terms of other gall formers looking for other experience that other people have with this so that we can enlighten our our uh, survey and perhaps mitigation actions we're still uncertain on all that so as i mentioned lots of other hosts uh commercial nursery stock is probably affected is commercial nursery stock a potential vector probably do we need to worry about that do we need to survey for it probably um, the one interesting thing is that we couldn't find it on Japanese beach here in the U.S., although I believe some of the symptoms have been seen on Japanese beach uh, elsewhere in the world, but I'm uncertain of that. I don't have a reference for it, but I do have uh, anecdotal experience from people. So um, there are lots of other things that look like uh, beach leaf disease. This is down here in the lower left is a picture of a freshly emerged beech leaf that's just starting to show the nematode induced gall stripes on the leaf. Uh, this on the other hand is uh, an example of area of fired mites that cause similar types of banding, although the galling is not obvious when you look at it. So I think at first training is definitely needed, but also the area of fired mites are much more uh, local in their infestation display. Uh, dispersion and so I would say that uh, generally speaking if you're going out there looking for beech leaf disease you will be pretty quickly um, understand what is and isn't the disease itself especially if you go to one of the areas with a known that's known to be infested it's best to stand underneath the canopy and look up because the sunlight shining through the leaf shows more clearly the banding even as in this picture down here in the lower left, even that light banding is much more obviously seen when you stand under the tree and look up. So these are all examples of standing under the tree and looking up up here in the upper right. You can see clearly the galling from the nematode is, is easily visible. And as I mentioned before, the infestation seems to start at higher densities lower down in the canopy and on the ground cover, as I mentioned before, they're the first to die and then it moves up. Um, over here in the upper left, you can see that in um, some circumstances, we don't know whether this is genetic uh, or what, but leaves to much more uh, discoloration, yellowing and, um, and deformation of the leaf, uh, probably also associated with the presence of the galling nematode, but again, we haven't done enough to um, chop these things apart and look for what's exactly going on. Hopefully that's being done right now, but COVID-19 is having an impact on our ability to get out there and look for it. So the first thing in 2012 in Lake County, Ohio, as I mentioned down, uh, down here, 
<coughs> Cleveland uh, Central Parks. And then by the time um, 2018 shows around, you can see this is the rate of expansion, which is pretty rapid. We found it out in Chautauqua County, New York um, in 2018, and it had probably been there for at least two years, maybe more, we're uncertain. And uh, actually, I uh, see the map here says 17. I guess we did identify it. No, um, oh, uh, Pennsylvania Forester identified it in 2017 for us. And we sent cur survey crews out in 2018 and confirmed its presence. So, um, and there's been a publication on beech leaf disease describing the relationship between the symptoms and uh, the decline. There are a couple of those coming out as we speak. So uh, this is from last year, 2019 map. You can see that we've got it out here in Suffolk and down in uh, Westchester and Rockland and also uh, Jason in Connecticut. There's some significant infestations down here in Southern Westchester and out here in Central Suffolk. And um, I, uh, I'm concerned about the life of those beech trees and we would really like to get out there and do more intensive surveying. And I had hoped that we would have the ability to try some mitigation strategies. I wanted to go into some of our public lands uh, with um, collaborating partners and cut down some of the trees that are showing the presence of the nematode and are symptomatic and see whether or not we can monitor the rate of decline of the stand. It seems pretty clearly from the plots that we put in over the last two years that it does expand kind of like Brian said with the southern pine beetle. It starts in one spot and then moves radially away from that fairly quickly. And that was certainly the experience they had in Ohio and we're identifying those areas in New York where we have that kind of occurrence so that we can continue to monitor the rate of expansion of the symptoms. But we have no idea how to mitigate or how to stop or how it's dispersed or if it's vectored. So those are problems. Um, so like I said, why do we care? Well, this is the range of beach. You know, beach, as I mentioned, it's a, a major forest street tree and a major ornamental genus. And of course, the ecosystem values that are supplied by beach, it's one of the major contributors of soil nitrogen to our forests. It occupies and, re and uh, sustains riparian zones. The litter fall is critically important for all kinds of aquatic organisms as well as the litter, as well as the uh, upper soil organisms. It's massed, you know, it's very long lived. Who knows how many species actually feed on the mast of beach? It's probably you know, in the in the several hundred of arthropods alone, and um, it's a climax species in our forest. So we're really concerned about. We don't want to lose another major contributor like we lost chestnut 100 years ago. So, and it's a long lived. So we don't really get good seed from it until it's 60 years old. So, um, getting in the way of this beech leaf disease is pretty important to us here in New York. This is uh, an example of our surveys we did over the last couple of years and the red dots are where we absolutely positively identified it uh, according to these symptoms like you see down in the lower right and the green dots are areas where we did extensive surveys in beach stands and could not find any symptoms. So we don't know it's not there but these are negative surveys. So. And we've put up a bunch of monitoring plots in some of our beach stands, like I mentioned before, so that we can start to employ mitigation and the annual survey and rate of decline plots throughout our beach stands in New York. So um, Marjorie Daughtry of uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension published a great uh, little article about it in getting the word out. Um, and I uh, highly recommend that uh, you have a look at that. And um, uh, Mina Vicera was also um, a part of that. And it's, uh, if you want to know more about it, get a look at that. So I just wanted to talk a bit about Phytophthora and bleeding cankers because we're seeing an awful lot more of that also in beach. 
and uh, you know, paying attention to the crown transparency and uh, looking for small yellow foliage and long thin dead spots in bark and cambium, oozing wounds like up there on the upper left. And then of course the big one is that if you end up seeing any of these, try to dig the small roots out and see whether or not you've got fine root loss. You know, there should be a lot more fine root hairs on these roots uh, that uh, are not Phytophthora infected. And the thing about Phytophthora is it's very, very much related to soil moisture and wet woods so, or, or wet soil. So um, because it reproduces uh, by um, swimming. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the thing is, is that uh, when you see a beech tree starting to decline or getting some of these oozing spots on it after a, a, an encounter with a wet, puddle or a pond or something, it's probably gonna, gonna die from it and uh, you should um, um, treat it accordingly. So one of the things about the uh, Phytophthora diseases and the uh, bark and outer sapwood is this kind of stain that you see. You don't have to dig down very deep into the uh, bark to see this. It kills the tissue and oozes dark sap. It looks stained, water soaked, like I said. It has a very well-defined margin. Um, and as, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the root disease, you can see the loss of the fine root hairs, disrupts translocation. Uh, the color change in the leaves is fairly rapid and then you wilt and then it's sudden death. So what happens in the case when I get called to Phytophthora, Phytophthora infestations is people say, well, there was nothing wrong with this oak tree. There was nothing wrong with this beech tree. It, started to leaf out and then suddenly it just died and uh, that's pretty typical of what happens with this uh, with this disease. There are ELISA kits that you can get that are pretty good for field identification. We have some of them. Um, we would uh, uh, help to, we use them to deploy for those kinds of situations where Phytophthora is perhaps more frequently encountered but it's uh, not ubiquitous so and also there are several species and it's pretty difficult to eliminate. And it's also difficult to detect and know for sure. Um, several treatments available. Timing is critically important. The big thing is to avoid wounding the trees. These diseases need to have an entrance point. So you need to, as I mentioned before, they're water oriented, so avoid puddles or splashing. And uh, thick mulching will reduce the splash and germination of the disease, but uh, there are also other problems associated with thick mulching. So you need to use all of your knowledge to make those kinds of decisions properly. Saturated soils, wet soils, those are to be avoided if you can for those um, uh, mainly, most of the, there aren't very many trees that are not susceptible to Phytophthora infestation. A uh, beech just happens to be the most probably. And um, there are other Phytophthora, for example, sudden oak death that's devastated all the oak forests out in California is a Phytophthora. And if you want to know more about what could happen there, read about that thing because it can be very daunting to try to treat and um, very daunting to uh, lose your your beech and or oak trees. Uh, we recently had some horticultural shipments to Indiana and neighbors with sudden oak death. So we're concerned about that uh, last year, but it seems like nothing really happened. And then the other Phytophthora is potato blight. You, everyone probably remembers hearing about that. So um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was this new beech leaf mining weevil, a beech pest that showed up in Nova Scotia and uh, a couple of years ago, and it's uh, related to southern pine beetle <coughs> in that it's a beetle and it's also tiny, tiny. It's uh, less than a tenth of an inch long, which makes it smaller than uh, the southern pine beetle. Its genus uh, and species name is Orchestes phagi, and it kills trees. That was kind of surprising to me when I first read about it. You know, what's with this thing? It's just a leaf miner down here in the lower left. You can see the egg was laid here. The larvae developed and crawled down here and then they, uh, they um, fed in the spongy measles fill in the leaf tissue and uh, then they turned into adults, tiny, tiny, tiny little adults 
like this guy over here that's less than a tenth of an inch long. So uh, what's going on? Well, as it turns out, uh, there's just lots of them. They come out in um, incredibly uh, large numbers and they lead to excessive defoliation, both from the larvae and from the adult feeding on the, be on the beech trees in Nova Scotia. And it seems like it's feeding on all of the beech trees and it also feeds on red maple and red spruce, although not the larvae, mainly the adults. And uh, so far in Nova Scotia, they've been finding lots and lots of dead beech in these heavily infested areas. And uh, Mark Whitmore, a good friend of mine and probably yours, who's mostly involved with uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid was out there last fall. And he uh, called me from there and said, you know, you won't believe how many beech trees seem to be dead from the impacts of this leaf mining weevil. So we really want to look out for it. It's, it's tiny, it's hard to see, it's probably going to move around and everything. And so uh, we would like everyone to be aware of this uh, leaf mining symptom. And I know there's tons of these little tiny micro or little tiny weevils out there. And uh, Dan Gilrain can probably tell us about a whole bunch that he knows of and uh, I suspect that we will have to get a better understanding of how to separate these things taxonomically at our diagnostic lab very soon. So um, five to 10 years beach mortality, and this is the number that we got last fall. It went from 18% death in the stand in 2014 to 88% in 2015. And it seems like the only cause of that mortality was the presence of this beech leaf mining weevil. That's a pretty daunting implication for how important this pest could be to our beech stands. So, and both adults and larvae cause a defoliation. Many hosts. Walnut, apple, cherry, apricot, lots of, so the ag people um, are going to be very interested in uh, whether this thing gets. The other thing is, is that it's a, it's a flea beetle, meaning that it jumps when you spook it. So it's hard to collect the uh, adult, very difficult to collect the adult. It'd be like trying to collect a flea that's uh, on your, on your hand. They oviposit in the spring, overwinter as adult. Um, <clears throat> they only oviposit on wheat, on beach. They only lay their eggs on beach, and the mar larvae only mine beach leaves. So that's going to be the critical diagnostic for us: is the mining of the beach leaf. Uh, and uh, huge rapid population buildup and uh, outbreaks in Europe seem linked to drought. So we're going to maybe try to do more climate and or drought regime mapping. Uh, and of course, there's no natural enemies so far. So there it is again. There's the uh, the the larvae under microscopic uh, under a microscope, and there's the adult, and there's the mine. So they tend to almost always start right from the midrib, and they mine down to the leaf tip. And I think that's about as much as I know. So the other thing, the last thing I want to talk about was this uh, other agrada that was found at Greenwood Cemetery. We don't know almost anything about it. It's just called, um, it's called, uh, what is it, um, Agrylus 9895. It doesn't even have an actual specific name yet because it's newly identified. I think that the Forest Service taxonomist that was working on identifying it has got a proposed species name. I just don't have it in my files. So we still don't know whether it's going to be a pest. Uh, it could be significant in oaks. It's like as Rob Cole mentioned, the two-line chestnut borer, here it is here, and or the emerald ash borer, there are also grads. They give this typical meandering type of, of um, larval gallery under the bark, and, um, and it's close in size. So larval galleries are meanders, like I said. So this was smaller than the two-line borer, which is smaller than the emerald ash borer, although I believe that their adult sizes overlap in terms of the uh, terms of the variance. So that's that one. Uh, keep your eyes open. So it's all about early detection and uh, rapid response for any of these things. Please, please, please pay attention to what you see as something different and let us know when you see it. And I think that's all I had. Oh, I had, yeah, the value of finding it small and the fact that we can overcome that with the resources we have 
And uh, I showed this slide before. This less political persuasion needed is huge in New York State because no matter what you do, whether it's on public or private land, there's always somebody that's interested in what you do, and then there's somebody interested in what you don't do. And of course, our firewood regulations. Oh, that was the other thing that the uh, weevil is probably implicated in uh, movement of firewood because the adults jump around and they like to find places to secure themselves. So, and, uh, and uh, for a lot of these things, we don't want to have too little too late. Thank you, Jerry. See if we have any questions. We have some questions. Are Jerry, are there other weevils that develop from the mid vein on beach, or is it that pattern unique? Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. That's why I dropped Dan Gilrain's uh, name. He may know. I don't know of any, and I tried to do a search just uh, last night. I thought of the same thing, and I couldn't find it. But uh, I suspect not, but I don't know for sure. The, the sharp answer is take a picture of it and collect the sample, and then we would be able to uh, do the further diagnostic. All right. Thank you. The, for the beech leaf miner, when do the mines start becoming visible? Yeah, they start to become visible uh, shortly after um, um, oviposition, which occurs just after the leaf is full. So, uh, you know, early summer, late spring, early summer. Thank you, Jerry. And Jerry has another presentation. Am I doing that right now? On the brown tail moth, if you would oh, like. All right, okay, I'll just uh, share that. Uh oh, what did I do here? All right, so the brown tail moth, uh, <clears throat> Euphroctus chrysleria, it's an interesting beast. Uh, I've spent a few days out in Maine looking for it, and I've spent several days in New York and had several um, people looking for it here and not been able to find it, but it's pretty impressive in its population size and what its impact is in Maine. So it was introduced in Massachusetts accidentally in the last half of the 19th century, right around the gypsy moth introduction a little later. But now it seems to be mainly in Maine and it had been reported in New York and I think it had been reported on Long Island and definitely uh, in Westchester. But um, we've surveyed for it and never found it or I've never found it, none of our staff have found it. Uh, the reason it's called brown tail, you can see it inside this yellow circle, it's got a distinctive brown tail on the, on the uh, adult moth. This, I believe, is a female. And uh, the brown tail moth caterpillar down here in the lower left is quite distinctive. It's a hairy moth <coughs> um, in the tussock moth family, and so it's... it's um, or lime and tribe family. And so it's uh, um, got these hairs that are urticating and or, well, not and or, they break off and they're filled with a toxin. And that toxin was injected into the body of the host and that causes an allergic response. Uh, this is a typical um, spring emergence where they feed an aggregation after they overwinter as larvae in these tented areas. And I've got some other uh, examples of that. So uh, there's a picture here of the kind of uh, urticating hair damage to someone who's sensitive to it. Actually, pretty much everybody is sensitive to it. Uh, so um, I'm sorry about that. That's the home, uh, <laughs> home office problem. Um, right. So. Uh, midsummer presence, and it seems coastal. In Maine, at least, the presence of large enough populations to cause a human health risk and to show up, uh, obviously, or just along the coastlines. And I mentioned the irritating hair thing, toxin filled, extreme rash, allergic responses. There's hospitalizations every year, and it's not just this rash, but it leads to some serious aches and headaches, and uh, in some, respiratory failure due to the reaction to the toxin. Uh, 
which is kind of interesting in terms of the biology, but not so interesting in terms of the human health risk. So I don't know why we don't have it anymore or still or yet in New York. I don't know whether it's going to be a climate change scenario for us, but we look for it every year and it's pretty easy to see. The, um, the life cycle is kind of interesting. The adults are around in very late summer and they mate and they oviposit on the leaves and they lay 200 to 400 eggs on the leaves. And the, <coughs> the eggs, when they hatch, they do this communal feeding and they skeletonize the leaf and it doesn't really cause any damage in the fall. But this is also highly visible symptom uh, of a brown tail moth uh, outbreak in the area. But then once the weather cooled down, these larvae stay in the aggregate and they spin up like over down here on the lower right. They spin up a couple of leaves into a shelter, tightly wrapped and then wrapped again with silk. And they overwinter in there, which, uh, which is pretty strange because it's, they're right out there in the wind. You can see here in this picture, these are the the overwintering shelters on the tips of these oak trees in coastal Maine. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it's coastal, because uh, when they get further away from the marine environment, the cold wind is just too much to keep them from surviving. So here's a close up of the, uh, of the silking starting, and you can see this egg mass uh, has just hatched, and these guys are feeding whether or not this will be two or three or more of these overwintering bundles, we I don't know. But um, <coughs> but these are really easy to see, uh, even at 70 miles an hour down the throughway, uh, I was able to see them pretty clearly. So if you ever see anything like that, let us know and we'll get in there and try to determine where the heck they are and why they are there. Um, the brown tail, is um, one of our, uh, you know, we're worried about it, but just re relative to the defoliators that we have here, the Eastern tent caterpillar and the forest tent caterpillar and the gypsy moth, they're, they're pretty dissimilar. So take pictures, send them to us. Here's the male moth. You can see it also has a brown tail and, and the, there's, oh no, sorry. This is the female moth. You can see the brown tail. This is the male. You can see he has the uh, uh, plumose antennae that are for uh, pheromone response and capture so they can find a mate. And I think, oh yeah, and <laughs> moth apocalypse. I captured these from Maine, you know, the brown tail invasion. Lots and lots of public interest in the thing. Um, people, uh, signs out on the, uh, Frequently frequented ocean sides saying avoid contact with these caterpillars, talking about uh, showing and finding them. And then there are some people that spray for them uh, in the early fall and, uh, and spring. So any questions on that? Yes, Jerry. Do other moths slash insects skeletonized leaves like that also yes but not quite as obviously and not just in the fall like that so uh yes there are leaf skeletonizers they're far less um organized in their feeding like if you notice those pictures that i had uh they were in a line feeding in the aggregate and that's pretty typical at least of all the ones that i saw whenever the Females lay their eggs on the leaf and then all of those eggs hatch and they all feed on that leaf in the aggregate, skeletonizing it like that. So it is pretty unique, but there are other skeletonizers. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Our next speaker is Jessica Cancellari who will give a presentation on jumping worms, distribution, concern, and early detection needs. For those of you who weren't with us this morning, Jessica is a research scientist with DEC Forest Health. Jessica manages the Forest Health Diagnostic Lab 
which provides diagnostic services and research support to public and private land managers. So please welcome Jessica. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. We can hear you and see the presentation. Thank you. Great. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about jumping worms. Uh, before going into jumping worms specifically, I want to talk a little bit about uh, earthworms in general, because jumping worm is a type of earthworm. So the dangers of an earthworm invasion are, you know, kind of hard to grasp if, like most of us, you've been raised to think of earthworms as nothing but beneficial, right? They've been a long, uh, a long time symbol of a healthy ecosystem. You know, we're told they aerate the soil, they reduce soil compaction, improve drainage, uh, they break down organic matter into micronutrients that plants can use. And of course, they leave behind valuable fertilizer in the form of their castings. So having a lot of earthworms should mean that you have healthy soil. So much of these touted benefits of earthworms are in fact true, um, but really only in agricultural settings, not in forest settings. So a managed agricultural field is a much different system than a natural forest. Uh, it's a little bit more of a closed system that can be controlled, right? So if there's a soil deficiency in an agricultural field, you can add fertilizer. Uh, forest plants, however, rely on complex symbiotic relationships with mycorrhizal fungi. And of course, if a deficiency exists there, it'll be much harder to resolve. Uh, also effects like soil aeration may benefit an agricultural field or an agricultural setting where soil compaction is more of a, a common issue. Um, worms, though, can cause trouble in agricultural settings as well um, because their burrows create channels that allow for nutrients and pesticides to leach out uh, into nearby waterways and um, may even add to the emission of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide uh, into the atmosphere. And there has been a recent review um, of jumping worm research, or I'm sorry, European earthworm research that showed that they may be actually contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So the schematic on the left shows a healthy intact ecosystem with that thick, you know, organic soil layer, layer at the top. Um, this ecosystem is devoid of earthworms. The schematic on the right shows um, an area that has been invaded by earthworms. And um, you can see that that soil horizon on the top is missing. So when earthworms invade, you know, they eliminate that organic horizon on the top. Uh, they speed up the decomposition of the leaf layer, and uh, that eventually causes the layers to mix and, you know, the top layer to effectively disappear and mix with the, lo the lower level, and it becomes like one homogenized layer. Um, so as that layer disappears, it exposes plant roots, um, it causes plant root uh, desiccation, and eventually death. Um, and also it, you know, changes the texture of the soil so that nutrients and water are more easily leached out of the system. So when this happens, um, Annis Dobson, a forest ecologist from Yale, has done some interesting research to show that there are clear winners and losers in this situation. The winners being plants like grasses and sedges, uh, disturbance adapted species, and of course non-native plants. And there's been a lot of research that shows a strong correlation between the presence of specific invasive plants like stilt grass, uh, buckthorn, and garlic mustard, where um, they found you really can't find one of those plants without also finding uh, earthworms, non-native earthworms. So the losers in this situation, unfortunately, in something like a northern hardwood forest, are all the plants that we really want to be there, right? Like our charismatic long-lived perennials, like trillium, uh, our northern hardwood uh, seedling regeneration, you know, of oak or sugar maple or beech. Um, and of course, any plant that might rely on uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So it's thought that um, native earthworms were once widely distributed across North America, uh, but were severely pushed back during the last glaciation period that started about two and a half million years ago and lasted until about 11,000 years ago. So as the glacier receded, earthworms were pretty slow to recolonize the continent just because they have a slow rate of dispersal. So what that means is that our northern forests have established in the absence of earthworms for 11,000 years. 
and technically they're not even supposed to be here. Um, they're, they're not supposed to be east of the Great Plains or north of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, but, you know, thanks to us and the way we move things around the globe, uh, earthworms have been continuously introduced from uh, Asia and Europe. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we do have some native earthworms. They're just not as common, um, but they behave much differently than the introduced earthworms. And they also typically exist at much lower abundances than the introduced earthworms. So the, the photo on the right shows a few different species. Um, you know, the white one in the upper left is a native species um, by Mastis. And then you have Lumbricus up to the, the upper right, which is a European earthworm, and Amenthus, which we're going to talk about much more, which is the Asian earthworm. And let's see that. Oh, you know, and I didn't explain my uh, quote here. That also came from and as she, call, she calls this whole earthworm invasion global warming, which I just got a kick of and thought it was a great phrase. So jumping worms have scientists much more concerned even than European earthworms do. Um, the, they have a East Asian origin, right? Japan and Korea, uh, where they're found in Japan and Korea everywhere, like from the, the coldest sections, you know, the highest mountains to, you know, right next to the ocean in the more temperate regions. Uh, currently, there are 16 species in North America. We have five here in New York, most of which are represented to the right. Uh, and they exhibit what is called sympatric occurrence, meaning that they're usually, you know, cohabiting an environment. You don't typically find just one species. You'll find at least two or three or four all living together. And this is relatively new information, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, they're also consistently moving northward and westward into uh, colder climates, which is not good. You know, the adults are relatively um, sensitive to the cold, so, um, but the cocoon stage is pretty hardy. And so I think that's what's enabling them to continuously move into colder environments. So right now, this says, you know, New York distribution, put that in quotations, because um, all of the information that we have about the New York distribution is a result of IMAP reporting and uh, you know whatever research has been done out there with uh, sampling sites across New York. So I'm guessing this is a gross underestimate of what is actually here. Um, you know, it, it's probably ubiquitous, and we're going to talk about reporting in a little while because I think that's going to be you know the most important factor to help uh, increase our understanding of the jumping worms. So I wanted to highlight the research of this team because I thought it was really cool and it and it, it was just published a couple of years ago. For a long time, it was thought that only Amenthus agrestis um, was present in much of the Northeast. You know, we thought that that was the primary species that was around. Um, but the work of this team sort of blew that out of the water. Um, and as you can see here on this schematic on the right, it basically shows all the sampling sites across the Northeast. And then in those little colored boxes, each, each colored box represents a different species. So yellow H is um, Metafire Hilgendorfi, which is one of the five species that I said was in New York. Um, so, you know, there's two major genus genera, right? There's Metafire and Amenthus. And Amenthus has more species, I think, in New York than uh, Metafire does. So the yellow H is Metafire, uh, the orange a is Amenthus agrestis, and then the green T is Amenthus tokioensis. So as you can see at most sites, you know, there's multiple species present. And so, you know, this group thinks that there's been multiple species present in New York this whole time. It's just that we weren't very good at identifying them. And so they think that these other species have just been mi misidentified as Amenthus agrestis for years. So, you know, how are jumping worms different than European earthworms? Why are they more impactful? Um, what makes them so destructive and so successful? Um, so a little bit about their behavior and biology. They're epo epoendogeic, which means that they live and feed in the very top layer of the soil. They feed within three centimeters of the soil surface, which is really different than a European earthworm, which goes down to much greater depths. Uh, they live at very high densities, up to 100 worms per square meter, uh, and they can reproduce asexually. They're parthenogenetic. 
uh, so they can self-fertilize. They don't need a mate to reproduce. Uh, they have a flexible diet. So, you know, European earthworms are a little more selective. I don't know the exact order, but for example, you know, they'll prefer maple leaves over oak, you know, over beech or something like that. It goes in a particular order, you know, whereas jumping worms will pretty much feed on anything. Um, and they also have a flexible habitat. Uh, like I said, they're all throughout Japan and Korea. And in those locations, they're found everywhere from agricultural settings to urban areas, to forests, um, to even like, you know, the, the most uh, arid regions of their countries, they're everywhere. And of course they can grow quickly. Um, they have an annual life cycle and they reach maturity in less than 60 days. They also um, all mature at the same time, like later in the summer. So jumping worms are so destructive because they just cause really big changes in the soil. Um, primarily, they change the consistency of the soil. By the time they've sort of worked through an area, the soil basically contains only worm castings. You know, so, so the soil, it's, it's been compared to um, spent coffee grounds, right? So you have these little aggregate balls that are left behind um, that are very coarse. And in fact, it's not really even soil anymore. It's like just worm castings. And so these, these little balls actually lock up nutrients and chemically alter the soil composition. Um, and, and these little balls have actually been studied and found to contain like heavy metals like iron and aluminum and nutrients like potassium and calcium. Uh, and because they're locked up, you know, they're much uh, less accessible to plants. So for example, um, it's been shown that the effects on the soil, they go down deep. So, you know, 25 centimeters down, even though, you know, they feed at the top three centimeters, you go 25 centimeters down and you're still seeing the impacts of jumping worms. And because they've changed this layer, you know, these nutrients are leaching out much more quickly. So what's affected, you know, the, the mature trees aren't that affected because they have deep roots and they're able to still capture some of these nutrients. But what's primarily impacted is the understory vegetation, you know, the young plants, or smaller plants that have more shallow root systems. Uh, they're used to, in a normal forest, you know, a very slow release of nutrients into the soil, whereas jumping worms just like severely accelerate that process and it all happens so fast. And then because the, the soil texture has changed, you know, water and nutrients leach out and they just can't capture them before they're washed away for good. And so you can kind of see the difference up in the upper right hand corner of a, in, I guess my picture kind of blocked the description a little bit. On the left is an invaded area where you can see some of that aggregate soil and on the right is an uh, un uninvaded area. And here's another photograph that's widely shared for invaded and unvaded areas. You'll see the healthy sugar maple regen in the photo on the left, no regen on the right. Um, and eventually, I think, you know, if you took another photo of this forest, um, even just later in the season, all of that leaf litter would be gone. You know, there's um, been documentation of 95% of the leaf litter disappearing within one growing season. So to identify an invasion, there's a few things to look for. The granulated soil that we talked about. Uh, again, look for worms in the late summer or early fall. Uh, the younger stages, look exactly the same as the adults, except for they're tiny, and they don't have the characteristic uh, clitellum that we're going to talk about in a minute. So they're just hard to find. Um, so looking in the late summer is best. And, you know, the, the behavior is a big one. So I have um, a YouTube video on the next slide. I don't know if it's going to work, though. All right, it looks like it might work. So this is, you know, obviously where the jumping worm got its name from. It writhes and wriggles really quickly. They're very fast, a little bit creepy. And then if you look at the European earthworm, very different mode of transportation. It constricts and contracts. Now, although European earthworms typically can move a little faster in this video, you know, the, the method of movement is the same. You get the idea. Right, now I just got to figure out how to get to my next slide. <laughs> okay. So I mentioned the clitellum earlier. This is 
once you see worms and you collect them and you want to ID them, this is one of the easiest ways to differentiate between a European earthworm and a jumping worm. Um, they both have this clitellum on their body. Uh, in the European earthworm, uh, it's saddle-like and segmented. So if you look close at it with the arrow up there at the top, you know, you can see um, that it's broken into smaller segments. It's sort of orange or peachy colored. And like I said, it's saddle-like, so it sort of protrudes outward from the body and, you know, almost like, you know, it's wearing like a, it's like in an inner tube or something. <laughs> and then the Asian jumping worm has a ring-like clitellum that's flush with the body. So it's smooth, uh, there are no segments, and it's usually whitish in color. There's not that much out there yet for control, unfortunately. So that's why I think we really just need to focus on uh, not so much early detection, but you know, just detection and reporting where we have it so that when control methods do become available, we at least know what parts of the state might be most impacted. Um, but the simple things that you can do to prevent movement is a uh, clean, you know, what I guess what I failed to mention so far in this presentation is that these worms are associated mostly with horticultural fill, compost, mulch. Um, they're most often moved around in their cocoon stage, um, in gardening equipment, in soil, you know, in potted plants that you buy at you know, your local nursery or plant sale, um, but also tire treads. If you've, especially like if you're in a forested area that's infested, uh, your tire treads can pick up cocoons and transport them with you. Um, so just being mindful of that is good, cleaning your soil equipment. I know that a lot of, you know, extension offices are starting to, um, you know, initiate more practices regarding, um, you know, plant sales and what they do with the soil and the roots. Um, commercial compost so far is actually known to be relatively safe because the way they process it, it gets to temperatures that are so high that it kills the jumping worms. Um, but compost that you might um, make at home or that a friend of yours makes might, you know, it probably doesn't reach those temperatures and does not kill jumping worms. Um, and of course, fish bait is a big vector as well. Sometimes European earthworms, you know, the night crawlers are um, unknowingly infested with jumping worms. So, you know, don't dump out your extra worms in the lake if you're fishing. Um, and so it looks like the future research on control is sort of focused around the cocoon stage because they found that it, the membrane of the cocoon, even though it's, it's pretty hardy and cold tolerant, it's, um, it's permeable to, uh, to certain chemicals. And so I think you know, that's where we're gonna see the first treatments, but there's really nothing to share right now. And I think that's all I have. Oh no, so I'm sorry, I'm a little over. Reporting, um, there's multiple ways you can report, but IMAP really has the most comprehensive database right now. So if you have an IMAP account, you should report sightings that way. That is the preferred method. If you don't have an IMAP account, you should find out how to get one, because it's a good thing to have. Um, and I know that these are recommendations that come right from IMAP. They want multiple images for confirmation. Uh, after you've taken those images, dispose of the worms by freezing or in ethanol and include any additional observations that might be helpful to them. And um, just some advice on, on photographs that also comes from IMAP. They get a lot of these pictures, so they, they know what's good and what's not. Uh, make sure that they can see the clitellum. Uh, you know, try to, to line the worms up. And with jumping worms, you're obviously gonna have to kill them first before you line them up. They're not gonna sit still for you. Uh, make sure the picture is in focus, et cetera. Et cetera. And of course, the scale is important. And I think that's all. Any questions? Hi, Jess, it's Polly, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Polly. Okay, so there's um, a couple questions. One was whether the jumping wardens are problematic, <clears throat> excuse me, in Japan. Oh, you know, that's a good question. I think that they're not as problematic. I don't, I don't have a good answer for this, I'm sorry, but I, I think I recall reading that they're not as problematic because, um, again, their their forests and you know other areas have like adapted more. Um, they've adapted with the environment, unlike here. Uh, there's more natural enemies, um, you know, more parasitic fungi, things like that in the soil. So I think that their uh, mortality rate is higher, natural predation rate, etc. Um, but that's all I know. Okay. 
Um, another question was, is if there's any birds or insects that are native in New York that uh, can or could feed on them to help manage the population? Well, I'm guessing there are, and it's funny because in you know all the reading I've done on jumping worms, nothing about birds has come up. Um, I haven't even heard any reference to sightings of you know people seeing them feeding on jumping worms. I don't see why not, especially if they are endogeic, epa endogeic, and they live in the top three centimeters of the soil. They would be pretty easy pickings for birds, I guess. Though, unlike you know, it, it reminds me of a similar question we get with pests like emerald ash borer, you know, whether or not the woodpeckers will help control the infestation. I think that it might make a small dent, but the, the density at which these worms live at and the rate at which they're spreading and the success that they have in reproducing each year, I think the birds would probably not make much of a difference in the long run. Although it will help bird populations, I'm assuming, just like we've seen with woodpeckers. In areas where you have high density of EAB, you have, um, you know, population booms of certain species of woodpeckers. Right, yeah, pretty op opportunistic. Yeah. A um, couple other, whoa, a whole bunch of questions coming in. Oh. Um, one question is whether, how long they might have been known to be occurring in the New York metro area. Oh, that's a good question. But there's been reports of loss of leaf litter for a decade or more. Yes. So these worms have actually been around quite a while. Um, I think it's speculated that they actually came into North America as early as like the early 1900s. And there were reports in the Midwest of them in like the 1930s. And, and I think the first known report in New York um, was in the 40s. So it's interesting because it's not a new species, but I think, um, it seems to be, you know, new to a lot of us and that, you know, perhaps populations were suppressed for some unknown reason. I mean, just like, you know, there, there is some temperature limitation limitation. So I'm guessing as in some areas our minimum temperature, winter temperatures have increased over the years, you know, perhaps, uh, it's able to distribute more across the continent. I don't know, but it's actually not that new. Okay. Um, well, I think we're running short on time. There's a couple other questions that maybe you could answer at, at the end um, after you're done talking about the EDRR and ambrosia bark beetle monitoring. Sure. That would be helpful. Um, yeah, I'm just looking for it. So it looks like uh, Bill may not be on anymore. So um, do you want to just continue to speak about the bark and ambrosia beetles? And yeah. We, we need to introduce you again. <laughs> Sure, let's do it. <laughs> okay. One sec here. All right, EDRR. So EDRR is a specific survey, a specific trapping survey that the DEC participates in annually. It's a federal program and there's many other states that cooperate. Uh, it stands for Early Detection Rapid Response, which is funny because that applies to basically everything we do in the Forest Health Program. Um, but this one is particular to non-native bark and ambrosia beetles. Uh, non-native wood boring insects in general, you know, have always posed a significant threat to not only the health of North American forests, but their species diversity and uh, productivity as well. So the introduction and establishment of these non-native species has already had, you know, profound ecological effects. If you look at, you know, the virtual eradication of ash, for example, um, but, you know, invasive bark beetles pose numerous challenges, you know, like the fact that uh, host affiliations may change once they arrive here. You know, there's usually little known about uh, their potential hosts. They have the capacity to change. Um, so then their potential distribution is hard to predict. Um, also, ecological niches of invasive bark beetles may overlap with our native bark beetles and uh, displacement of native species can occur. Um, and invasive bark beetles also tend to introduce invasive pathogens, right? Or act as vectors of already established pathogens. Um, and of course, the absence of natural enemies from their native range may help them get a better foothold in North America uh, and allow populations to grow. So just a little bit of background about them before we talk specifically about the survey. Um, so bark and ambrosia beetles form a large group of small wood boring uh, beetles that bore into trees and shrubs and vines 
uh, in all forest and shrub habitats throughout the world. Um, some of the best known pests are destructive to conifers in the northern hemisphere, such as southern pine beetle, as we all know about, mountain pine beetle out west. Um, other species are pests of you know, ornamental trees, fruit or forest trees, and uh, like I said before, some vector important fungal diseases like um, the walnut twig beetle vectoring thousand cankers disease. Uh, most species though that are introduced are not considered economically important. Um, there's a lot of beetles here that are just kind of here doing their thing that haven't yet caused a lot of damage. Um, but the group in general is really diverse uh, in terms of life cycles, host plant interactions. Um, I think currently there are um, 575 species known from the US and Canada, and about 60 of those have been introduced from Asia or Europe. So um, a lot of entomologists still accidentally call this the uh, scolited family because for a long time, um, Scolitidae was, was its own family, the bark and ambrosia beetles. And just recently it was put into this subfamily, Scolitini, underneath Kerfuglianidae, which are the true weevils. So um, bark and ambrosia beetles are one of the world's most successful invaders, uh, in part because they're so easily transported in wood products and solid wood packing material, or through the import of live plants on cargo ships. Uh, global trade has increased a lot in the last 30 years, um, and that's led to the acceleration of these introductions and establishments of non-natives, right? So uh, the World Maritime Network plays a huge role in today's spread of invasives, you know, both aquatic and terrestrial. And this figure here um, was just published recently, and it represents uh, one year of travel itineraries from 16,000, I think it was 16,700 cargo ships. You know, they used GPS data and tracked them. Uh, and New York and New Jersey were among the world's top, you know, 20 busiest ports. So I just always like having this visual of just how things move around our planet. And as Jerry pointed out before, you know, we're right in the red zone. So scolotines are generally divided into two main guilds according to their feeding habits, bark and ambrosia beetles. Uh, bark beetles derive their name from their habit of living and mining between the bark and the wood of trees and shrubs. Uh, adults excavate egg galleries in the phloem and all life stages are spent in the phloem, inner bark and outer bark, uh, except for when adults leave the tree to fly to a new host. Um, most bark beetles are considered uh, secondary mortality agents because they prefer weakened trees. Um, but, you know, during favorable environmental conditions, um, you know, populations can build up pretty quickly and attack healthy trees. Um, and most bark beetles have a symbiotic relationship with blue stain fungi. Um, they, they vector the blue stain fungus when they enter a tree and the blue stain penetrates the wood and makes it more digestible to the beetles. Um, but they do in fact feed on the wood and that's where they sort of differ, differ from uh, ambrosia beetles. So ambrosia beetles feed primarily on the ambrosia fungi that they inoculate in their tunnel. You know, they have, um, you know, special uh, mycangia they're called on their bodies that actually hold this fungi and they bring it with them and they cultivate it like little fungi farmers and that is what they feed off primarily. So um, ambrosia beetles also tend to attack weakened, dying or recently cut trees. Um, sometimes they'll attack lumber and decks, you know, before it's dried or freshly cut lumber and uh, they can cause pinhole defects and dark staining in the outer wood. Uh, so it's interesting because ambrosia beetles require specific climatic conditions, you know, for the growth of their symbiotic fungi. So, so we kind of see a difference in the way that they colonize North America and the way that they become established compared to bark beetles. Um, you know, ambrosia beetles have more needs. So they tend to be more localized and like, um, and, and more prevalent in warmer, wetter climates. Um, whereas bark beetles are less reliant on these conditions um, and are more homogeneous, you know, homogeneously distributed uh, throughout the landscape. So down below, you can just see some of the signs of infestation. Um, most of you living on, on Long Island are probably, probably pretty familiar with the pitch tubes. Um, that southern pine beetle causes or black turpentine beetle or ips, you know, some of our native bark beetles. Um, so you'll often see these little pitch tubes that kind of look like popcorn balls coming out of the tree. 
And that is a tree, you know, responding to the beetle trying to bore into it and exuding resin. Um, and then you'll see little tiny, you know, exit holes in the bark. And if you've cut a tree down, you may say you may see the the blue stain fungi, which is shown in the lower left hand corner there. Um, ambrosia beetles, you won't usually see pitch tubes, but you'll often see uh, frass at the base of the tree or in the you know crotch of a branch or something like that. Um, this slide was just to show how many. Um, native bark beetles we have that also cause damage. And when I say, you know, Dendroctinus frontalis is on there, which is southern pine beetle, which isn't technically native in the north, but it is native in the south. Um, so we have a whole suite of species that are non-native that also cause damage, um, you know, pretty periodically. It's just typically the damage is, is more localized and not as severe. Um, However, you know, a lot of it just depends on forest conditions, right? They, they go after weak and stressed trees. So if you have an overstock stand, you know, I think as Brian mentioned before during his Southern Pine Beetle presentation, they have capacity to do a lot more damage. So this particular survey, um, it was started around uh, 2001, a pilot phase. And I believe New York started participating pretty early. Um, at least by 2007, we were participating. Um, and the goal is to rotate the number of states that do it each year. So there's usually at least, I think, 22 states that participate. Um, but because of New York and the potential, you know, the, the severely high risk we have for new introductions, we do the survey every year um, because we just feel like we can't miss a year. There's, you know, potentially something new that we need to find. Um, and there's a uh, 10, usually 10 to 12 different target species, which I listed here. Um, the target species sometimes change over time. Selection is usually based on interception data at US ports of entry, uh, the potential damage an insect might cause, and also the availability, availability of traps and lures, right? Because, you know, what's the point of looking for an insect if we have no way to capture it? Um, so we're kind of dependent on, on the, on, appropriate trap types and, you know, species specific lures out there to capture these insects. And a lot of research and money goes into that. So we deploy these traps called uh, Lindgren funnel traps that they come in different units. Some of them have 12 funnels, some have eight, some have four. Um, and we set them up at 12 sites statewide, three traps per site. And there's a few different lures. So we have uh, two different traps that collect conifer bark beetles, and those are baited with a, an Ips lure, which is a species-specific lure for um, beetles in the, in the Ips genus, and alpha pinene, which is a host volatile. It's sort of a chemical that a pine tree emits when it's stressed out. And because these beetles are attracted to weakened trees, you know, they pick up on that, on that pheromone. I guess pheromone's not the right word. They, they pick up on that volatile scent and go after it. And then the ethanol lure is used for um, hardwood uh, beetles, beetles that are attracted to hardwoods. The survey lasts for 12 weeks. Uh, we collect samples every two weeks and change the lure every four weeks. So, oops, oh, I'm missing a slide on this one. There it is, wrong order. So the type of sites we look for, ideally we're trapping in New York City and Long Island every year which we haven't done, you know, we've trapped statewide. Um, sometimes we trap in state forests, but we, we try to target state forests that are close to high risk areas like distribution centers or ports of entry. Um, but ideally we like to put them smack dab, you know, in trees surrounded by an urban area or a place like on the right you see here, that's the Selkirk uh, rail yard. It's a, one of the biggest rail yards in the Northeast. And we often just put traps over in the trees that you can see surrounding the rail yard. Um, Prospect Park and Greenwood Cemetery, we're trapping both of those sites this year. I mean, if you, if you just look at that on a map, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming out of the cargo ships that come into the ports of um, New York City. And these beetles are looking for trees, right? So it's only natural that when they get off that ship, you know, Prospect Park is a, a pretty attractive place for them to head to right away. Um, and, you know, Jerry mentioned that new detection of the agrilis species at Greenwood Cemetery recently. I think a lot of um, forest entomologists are taking note of the value of a location like Greenwood Cemetery 
And um, we're just increasingly trying to work with our partners at places like that. And so this year, um, we've become heavily reliant on our, part, on our partners in Long Island and New York City. Um, that was sort of the plan all along. You know, we had a lot of great partners that agreed to put up traps for us. Um, and then when COVID happened, then we just had, then they really, we had to rely on them more heavily because we couldn't even get down there to do the training. Um, so it's great to know that this year, even though um, COVID has restricted much of our activity, that we still have some traps deployed in the, you know, most highest risk part of the state. So that makes me feel really good. And, you know, the more people from Long Island that choose to participate in the survey, the more coverage we can get. Because like I said, we, we would trap in these areas every year, but it's just logistically really hard to get down there regularly. You know, Forest Health, we're a small group that covers uh, the whole state. So results um, in recent years. So just to give you a little guide here, to th I just showed kind of the last few years of results um, and the colors on the left of the results match up with the colors on the right on the map, because what we try to do is focus our trapping in, in regions to save on traveling effort and such, and to try to, you know, get a little more dense coverage in an area rather than just putting one trap out in all of Western New York or so. So some of the take home results from the last um, few years. So in 2017, uh, three of the four most commonly caught insects, so th these are all going by numbers. So the highest these all represent the highest trap catches that we had. Um, three of the four were all non-native beetles. So Xyloborinus, Saxenii, Xylosandrus, uh, Crassoculus, I'm sorry if I'm botching that, and Xylosandrus germanus are all non-native beetles. Anasandrus sei was the only native beetle. So that's really <laughs> interesting to note. In uh, 2018, um, Three of the four top species were also non-native ambrosia beetles, and Anisandrus uh, mesh, if I'm pronouncing that right, has been very rarely collected previously, but it's becoming more common in trap samples. So the fact that we caught over 300 of them was kind of noteworthy, and it's showing that this particular species is becoming more established in New York State. Um, and 2019, it was interesting because we actually had, I think, three of the four there are actually native beetles. Xylosandrus germanus is the only non-native. And I think part of that was a function of where we trapped. Um, although we tried to target distribution centers, you know, central New York, it, it just isn't quite as populated and maybe just doesn't have quite the movement of materials and as many people, you know, as the other parts of the state. So I sometimes wonder if that has any relationship with, you know, where in the state we traveled or put traps or if it was just, uh, random. Um, but, but the take home is that there hasn't really been any very, very bad news yet. So that's good. Um, however, what the survey is doing is just, it's giving us more information. You know, there's so many of these beetles coming in every day and becoming established, and they're really hard to study. And so for a lot of these, you know, there's people that are just kind of waiting and paying attention and watching and and you know, just kind of hoping it doesn't turn into anything uh, really crazy. Um, you know, Xylosandrus germanus, which you can see on the screen there, that's pretty ubiquitous through New York, and it has been a pest um, in some New York apple orchards. Um, the the Anisandrus uh, mage that I mentioned, the exotic one that goes after hardwoods, um, a bunch of different species of hardwoods. Um, Oh, and, and then the, the other results I wanted to mention was in 2017, we had two new state records. And both of those came from downstate. One was from um, Greenwood Cemetery. And I believe the other one was from there in, uh, in the, wherever it was in the Lower Hudson Valley, that blue dot in the Lower Hudson Valley. And um, that's about it. Any questions? I'll put it on chat too, so I can try to see them. Um, let's see. We do have questions for you. Just going through them. Um, one question was um, about the trapping um, and whether the traps were set in the Adirondacks, but that no bark or native bark or ambrosia beetles were found. Yeah, we have put traps in the Adirondacks. Um, 
I see the map I showed you, I think we were just under the blue line, just south. But in previous years, you know, we've been doing this survey since 2007. And like I said, we alternate different areas of the state. Uh, we have trapped in the Adirondacks and uh, non-native beetles have been found. You know, there, there are those ones that are just sort of widespread already in New York, yet nothing new and particularly concerning has been found in the Adirondacks. And if anybody's interested too, please email me. I have access, you know, it's a lot of data and it's hard to summarize for, for you here, but um, you know, I could actually get you very specific species reports from the areas we've trapped. If anyone's interested, just shoot me an email. Great. Um, the second question was, um, you know, what kind of birds would predate on the, uh, these, these insects? Well, I'm, I'm guessing like with other wood boring beetles, uh, you know, woodpeckers do go after them. I see it. It just depends on how tiny they are. Um, you know, I think woodpeckers don't like to waste their time. They tend to go after the meatier ones. So some of the larger bark beetles like, like Ips and Dendrothenus, you know, I, I see woodpeckers feeding on. Um, however, inside of the tree, there's a whole community of predators um, more like insect predators that feed on these larvae. And so, you know, things like clarid beetles, longhorn beetles, um, maybe even some click beetles, you know, they're all under the bark with these larvae feeding on them. And it, it's a really interesting system that I, I don't know nearly enough about, but it was kind of interesting, like um, when Southern pine beetle invaded Long Island and we were going out early on scraping the bark and looking at these galleries, we did not see um, a lot of uh, predators in the bark. All these insects were missing and it was kind of concerning. But then you went back five years later and they were all very much there. Their, their populations had increased. So sometimes when there's a new introduction, there's a bit of a lag you know, before the, the natural predators move in, but eventually they arrive. Um, in my experience too, if you know, an easy way to tell whether they're being predated on by birds is if you get that kind of blonding effect that Dan highlighted with the emerald ash borer, you'll see it's, it's not necessarily, it's still blonding, but it's more of a red color on pitch pines where mm -hmm. they're peeling off the bark plates and exposing uh, the, the redder partial, part, part of the bark of the tree. So yeah, that's good. Thanks, Polly. Um, no, I think that was all the questions on the ambrosia and bark beetle uh, trapping. And thank you, Jess, for both right. your presentations, uh, or actually all three. Um, you know, you have, you're very articulate and I, I can tell it, it comes easy to you in giving these presentations. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Thank you. <laughs> Even I'm though sorry. they're generally not easy to do. <laughs> I'm sorry for going over. I apologize. No, that's fine. Um, so we're going to transition to our last presentation of the day. Um, we've actually had a change. Lindsay's going to give the presentation instead of Bill. Bill is uh, obviously we're all working remotely and he lives in Wading River and they've lost power and phone service. So um, we are going to have Lindsay give the presentation instead of Bill on the reporting channels to ensure rapid response to invasive species. Um, and Lindsay is a, a new employee to LISMA and we're very happy to have her. Um, uh, helping head up the uh, the education and field programming. Um, she joined us in January. Um, and she, um, prior to this, um, she worked with the Environmental Monitoring and Management Alliance, where she provided coordination support. She collected field data for long term monitoring monitoring projects and helped uh, the acronym is Emma. Uh, member organizations create and implement invasive species plans. So she's very well versed in invasive species and she's demonstrated that um, in her short stead here uh, with LISMA. And she has a bachelor's degree in biology from Vassar College. So with that, I'll um, let Lindsay continue on with the program and, uh, and enjoy uh, her presentation. I think it's important so that we wrap up the day knowing how you know, we can report some of these things that we may detect in the field. Thank you, Polly. Can you hear me and can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, so very convenient for uh, Bill to lose power and phone service right at the uh, beginning of when his presentation is supposed to be, huh? <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to be taking over talking about uh, proper reporting channels to ensure rapid response to invasive species. And this is on the fly, so um, please have patience, some patience with me. Um, so just first of all, a quick introduction to what the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area is. Um, we're a voluntary association of land managers and landowners working together to prevent the spread of invasive species on Long Island and in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Um, we were founded in 2001 um, and were uh, hosted by the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, um, which is a wonderful partnership because we can sort of collaborate uh, in doing invasive species control and the other side of it, which is restoration. Uh, we have more than 30 partners, including government agencies and nonprofits, and uh, we're funded by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. Um, we've been talking about invasive species all day, but just to sort of sum it up, uh, an invasive species is defined as a species that is non-native uh, to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Um, so LISMA's work in sum, uh, our goal is to coordinate a response to invasive species, um, again, in Nassau and Suffolk counties, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. Um, and what does this actually mean? Really, at its core, it means connecting land managers and the public to one another uh, and to resources that they need across the state to deal with invasive species infestations. Um, we help develop priorities for invasive species control across the island, and we do a lot of outreach and education as well. Uh, this is us, um, just so you know who we are. Um, Bill Jacobs is the program manager, and that's me. Uh, so uh, LISMA is one of eight PRISMs in New York State. PRISMs are Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, and uh, as you can see, there is a PRISM that covers uh, each section of New York State. There's sort of, uh, each, each covers a portion of the state. Um, and the PRISMs sort of function similarly across the state, connecting their partners to one another, providing resources. Um, and the great thing about this network is that, um, you know, LISMA is in touch with all of these organizations across the state, um, and we can provide our partners with that connection as well. Our website is uh, lisma.org, so go ahead and check it out. Okay, so now on to the, the meat of the presentation, uh, the EDRR, the Early Detection Rapid Response Reporting Process. Um, so in summary, there are basically a few steps to getting the ball rolling here. Uh, the first step is uh, obviously that you have to collect observation details um, and, you know, as many of uh, these specifics as possible, GPS location, date and time, uh, a photograph and or sample of the species, the estimated population size, the reporter's contact information, um, as much of that information uh, as you can collect would be helpful for uh, getting that identification confirmed. Um, and of course, as Jess mentioned, um, you can uh, submit observations to IMAP invasives through the mobile app. The importance of IMAP invasives really can't be overstated. Um, the app essentially allows land managers and citizen scientists alike to report invasive species that they find. Um, and we at LISMA are actually alerted when invasive species are found, and um, so are uh, probably many of the presenters that we uh, heard from today. So for example, um, Jessica can set her uh, alert system so that she is notified whenever somebody reports jumping worm. Um, so so uh, as you can see, this is really powerful um, and important. So that's the first step, collecting the observation details. Um, the second step uh, is that you should submit the observation to us at LISMA or through IMAP Invasives. Um, and then after that, LISMA will seek official verification through the NYSDEC Forest Health, uh, New York State Ag and Markets, Cornell Cooperative Extension, or USDA APHIS. Um, the official verification process is necessary to sort of start um, the rapid response um, and, to, and to kind of get the ball rolling with the agency collaboration that, that, uh, that accomplishes that. 
um, you can contact these agencies directly. But the takeaway that I want you to get from this is that if you don't know exactly who to contact, you're not sure, um, you know, we heard from a lot of agencies today that are working with uh, specific species. If you're not sure who to contact, contact LISMA. We'll get you to the right place and we'll help you get the ball rolling. Um, and so once we have the observation submitted, we have official verification, um, we, we can get to the rapid response step, um, planning and uh, execution. So in terms of the contacts that you need to know about, um, obviously LISMA, um, you can contact Bill Jacobs, the program manager, or me, um, and there's our contact information there, as well as our website. You will get a handout after this presentation containing all of this information. So this is just a brief overview, but you will have access to uh, all of this information. New York IMAP Invasives is another um, mechanism for reporting. Uh, if you submit an observation to IMAP Invasives, like I said, Bill and I will see it, as I'm sure will many of the other uh, speakers that we heard from today. Um, something to note about IMAP Invasives, if you're not sure how to use it, uh, LISMA pr provides training uh, on how to use this app at no charge. I do also want to mention that many people uh, submit observations using iNaturalist, um, which is another app that can identify uh, species and LISMA is checking that as well. So if you report an invasive species through either of those channels, we will see it. Um, so other key contacts, the Forest Health Diagnostics Lab, we heard from several uh, uh, of the staff today. Uh, Jess, we heard from Jerry, Rob, and Brian. Um, and specifically, you can contact them for official verification of invasive animal pests and diseases. The New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, we heard from Tom today. Um, you can contact them for official verification of invasive plants and for spotted lantern fly and Asian longhorn beetle as well. Uh, the Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center, uh, Entomology and Plant Pathology Diagnostics Labs at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Um, you can contact them for official verification of commercial samples. Um, and we heard from Dan today. Um, if you are listening in from another part of the state, contact your local uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension. And um, if you have questions regarding your home garden, uh, you can contact the Home, ho the home Horticulture Diagnostic Lab at uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County as well. Uh, and I just want to thank you again uh, to our speakers and to our, our co-sponsors today. Um, it was a really wonderful presentation. We appreciate having all of you here. All right, uh, so uh, everybody uh, stay tuned and look out for that outreach packet that we'll be sending you with the contact information for EDR reporting. And thank you all so much. Have a great afternoon.